Hey everybody, thank you so much for checking out this video. It's your girl, LB. Welcome to my channel, Watch With Me, LB, where Bluesy and I give you fun, fresh, and funny rants, reviews, and recaps on our favorite movies and TV shows. And this one wasn't my favorite, okay? But I know that's because episodes seven and eight, they gonna knock my head between the wash and the dry. I already know. So they can't, you know what I mean? They gotta give us a false sense of security before we go into the final episodes of the season. This season has gone by so quicker. That is just really confusing to me because we just got it back and now it's getting ready to go away and I don't like that. So y'all, the episode opens up and Daniel and Rasheed are having a little snack, a little nosh. How did we get here? Like he's like Daniel's PO or something. I don't know why they would, I don't know. And Daniel said, you know what? Quick question. How did those tapes get in my mailbox? Cause they didn't have no stamps on them. They hadn't seen the post office. Did y'all get to my ma my mailman? Cause you know, that's Charlie. I used to give him a little gift at Christmas, but if y'all turn his ass into a Christmas tree, then I'm not gonna get him no gift. So like, how y'all got them tapes to me? That's the, you know, he really wants to get behind the logistics of the start of this whole shenanigans, right? So Rasheed looks at Daniel and say, I'm going to the bathroom. And as soon as Rasheed gets up, Raglan James with the most terrible name in all of humanity comes and sits right next to Daniel. And you know, Raglan is like a little personality. You know what I'm saying? He's like, oh, hey, Daniel, how you got, what you got going on? I really, they have the best mackerel here. I've been dreaming about it in my sleep, boy. Sir, you are a part of a clandestine organization. I don't want to hear nothing about that. No mackerel, what you talking about? What are you doing here? Does Raglan know about Rashid because Rashid rolled with Armand and Louis? Or does Raglan know about Rashid because Rashid is his brother and clandestine? Which one is it? I don't know. I don't know. Because Rashid ain't say nothing but 22 words this whole season. I don't know. I've never seen Rashid outside the apartment. I didn't know Rashid was allowed to leave the apartment. Comment down below and let me know, okay? Maybe I missed something. If there was something definite to determine or that let, that would let me know whether or not Rasheed is gone, you know what I'm saying, under, under the, the, the disguise of the Talamasca or if he just, you know, a slave. I don't know. Do they feed off Rasheed? Who the hell is Rasheed, though? Where they got him from? Let's talk Rasheed in the comments, y'all. Raglan James sitting there talking to Daniel about knickknacks and paddywhacks and halibut and sushi. And Daniel said, hey, excuse me, bro. I'm trying to get out of this interview alive. Can you assist me? What is the point of you coming over here giving me all this stuff if I'm just gonna die? Raglan said, probably not. I'm not even gonna lie to you. Probably not. Everybody who we have tried to protect, uh, we don't have a good track record. We got to do better. We got some meetings scheduled to, you know, figure it out. We got to get some plans in place. But currently, oh, I, Dan, listen, Daniel, I feel like does not want to live because the way that Daniel carries himself with Armand and Louis, he just don't seem like he want to live, but apparently he does. And old boy was like, oh, mm, sorry, I, don't, I can't help you. So Raglan says, listen, my um boss's boss's boss needs you to ask about a hundred questions. So if you could like thread those things into your interview, that would be great. We're gonna do our best to help you. But then Raglan says, because I've been hearing and reading in the comments of like um on Reddit and stuff that Raglan can swap bodies. And he said something like that in the episode. He was like, man, if I was you, if, if I could swap bodies with you, I would be running the show. I don't run the show. So I got to answer to my bosses. And I was like, oh, is that like, is that something we about to do? Because what is he even here for? He about to swap people and then we not gonna know who's what and who is who. That would be great. We ain't gonna get it no time soon though. So I'ma just calm down about it. I don't even know who I could compare them to, too. We over there with Armand and Louis. And you know, they had sold like a very expensive painting. I don't know why they sold a painting. Maybe they said something about it. I don't remember, child. But now they have a big blank wall in their home. First of all, their home looks like a river rock on the inside. This picture of smooth, black and gray textured river rock, okay? It got a little texture on it, but mostly it's smooth, mostly black and gray. Put, just picture that in a in the living room. That's what their house looks like. Just drab, baby. Just, 
Is it against the bylaws to have like color in your house if you're a vampire? I don't know. Anyway, so their wall is blank. It's huge and it's blank and it's just, they talking about what they could do with it. Very just fancy and hoity-toity child. Anyway, you know, Armand is suggesting something and Louis is like, no, I don't want that. And then Armand suggests something else, no, I don't want that. And then Louis is like, what if we put one of them pictures that you said was my picture on the wall? Louis is mad because obviously we remember last episode that Armand is a piece of shit. So now over there at the Theatre de Vampire, baby, they done left baby Lou and let her fall out that window one last time and they ain't never bring her back. Thank God for Jesus. Now they moving on to a new place. The Theatre de Vampire takes itself very serious for something that's just a front for eating people. Like they just fight. And Santiago is also a thesp. Okay. And so he's the lead of the play. And I know he like that because you know, Santiago was trying to be the center of attention. You know, everybody's rehearsing, but the people that are off to the sides, Santiago then gave everybody Claudia journal. Baby, they're reading down. Like they're pretending like they're reading the script, but they're reading Claudia's journal. And Claudia is back to doing like scut work. She's scraping up stuff off the, under the chairs and scrubbing the stage and polishing the light bulbs. And you know what I'm saying? And I am confusion. Cause if I'm Claudia, I'm asking to be in the background. Like, I don't want to clean shit. I just don't want to be the main one that got to be a little girl all my life. Like, why would she just be? All right, whatever. This part was really, really cool. So, Santiago is on the stage and he's doing his monologue. And Santiago, first of all, Santiago does not blink. And it's very creepy. He makes a great vampire. I don't know what he did in his life before. He was always meant to be a vampire. Because if if Santiago pre-vampire was trying to sell me like a car or was like the milkman, jail immediately. No, because he looks creepy. He doesn't blink. And he just is staring into my soul. And I'm way in New Orleans. And he is in the 1940s Paris. Don't look at me like that. The, the play has no roles for women. And so Santiago and, you know, all the other men are at the theater, but the two little scallywags, they just outside because they ain't got nothing to do, okay? Claudia, like a dummy at the, whatever. So they, the two scallywags go to Pierre Roger. Pierre Roger was the man who has Lestat's estate. They go to the man and it's like, hey, we want to invite Lestat to our new play. The man is like, oh, Hey, I haven't heard from him in a long ass time. Child, they put that vampire swizzle on him, and before you know it, the stat then got a phone call. It was cool because Santiago was doing his monologue, but also doing a vampire phone call to the two scallywags that was over there with Pierre Roger. And it was all happening at one time. And I swear the multitasking that vampires can do, if we could just bottle that, you understand? That's focus. And I love that for them. So now while this is happening, we getting flashbacks into Dubai in present time. And Armand is talking about how he had no idea what was happening. Armand be lying. Armand lies just like a rug, okay? He just lies all the time. Daniel in present time is like, I call bullshit. <laughs> I don't believe that you come from the year 100, the same time as the Targaryens did in House of the Dragon. And now you in 1940 and you don't see the forest for the trees. Like you don't see what's going on. I call bullshit. And me and Daniel is the same because I call bullshit. Our mind just be lying, just be saying stuff. Like for what, sir? So now flashing back to olden times, we see, you know, the street where Claudia Little Spooky has her shop. And they have these three people and they are drunk. They walking down the way and they have, they carry like a bucket. In my dumb ass mind, I'm like, oh, they got some milk. They're going home and try to sober up. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what that was, job. And they've been defacing her shop. And so, you know, old girl is in there, the dressmaker is in there, baby, and she is sick of it. If you want to paint my window, ain't going to be no more window. So she throws a iron through the window. And so it's two men and a lady. And two, the two men and a lady jump through the window and the two men attack the dressmaker Spooky. And they drag her to the back. Now, this will piss me off because the woman knew what, what they was going to do. They were going to go assault her in the back. She just let it happen. I cannot stand a girl who's not a girl's girl. I can't stand a woman who just allows things to happen to other women, other people. Like you just, she was just kicking it. Like nothing was happening. And I don't like that. I don't like that. And I'm glad that she caught some scissors in her throat. Claudia must have felt that action and came down there and threw them whole people all and ripped them up in half. Child, I'm good. Ain't good. Of course, old girl gets up to be like, what the fuck is going on? And she sees Claudia feeding off of one of the scoundrels. And Claudia was like, okay, listen, it's a lot. I know it's a lot. It's a lot that you've seen. It's a lot that didn't happen to you. 
you doing great by not running away and screaming. You doing a great job. Listen, you know, apparently she's okay with the fact that Claudia is dripping from the nostrils down with blood on her face. Okay, baby, listen, to each day on my love. Louis comes to the theater and he is so excited. He like coming in there, he got a painting and he's telling everybody hello and he's walking through and he's going to Armand's office. And so he gets in there and he's talking about this painting and you know, the light and you know, it's the blues and everybody's like, he's just very excited about this painting. And Armand is like, that's great. I'm glad you like the painting that you're going to sell it. Okay. You're going to do, oh, you're going to flip it. Oh, okay. Like he, you know, he in the middle of doing something and Armand is trying to be, you know, engaged with what he's talking about. And Louis just really get turned up. And Louis just all of a sudden says, take your clothes off. And our mind is like, I'm working. Take off your clothes. You can read me the lines in the coffin while I fuck you. Excuse me, Louis? And our mind was like, sir. Face down as a death to me. We like the face and the death to me. We like the... He ain't had no chill. Like, come on, lay down in a coffin with me, babe. It was me. That's the way we do. The office was basically like a glass cage of emotions, baby. It was full glass. And the glass was only blurry, only because it was dirty. Everybody could see what was going on. So now over there by Claudia. Baby, Madeline is completely enchanted with the fact that this bitch is a murderer. You understand what I'm saying? She is over there reading Claudia's diaries in Louis Coffin, which that was a choice. She is asking Claudia like what blood tastes like. She's like, girl, like, is it like drinking life itself? Claudia it was like, it's food. She was like describing a cheeseburger. It was like, I mean, like I needed to survive my love. And then Madeline was like, girl, you wanna, you wanna take a little, you want to take a little taste? Yeah, Louis walked in with a fucking attitude. Like, he had just got laid. Like, what is the problem? Shouldn't you just be like, yeah, bro, like, what's what's going on, Claude? He was like, yeah, what you got going on in here? Why is this bitch in my coffin? And then Madeline was trying to, like, be a human. But we was like, bitch, if you say another motherfucking word, I'm going to toss your ass over this balcony, and then it ain't going to be no more conversation. Be quiet. Okay, and so Claudia was like, Louis, relax. I done found the love of my life, bro. You gonna have to relax. You gonna scatter the streets, okay? Long story short, I had to murder a couple people in front of her. She was chilling. So Louis was like, is it romantic? And then they both said no, but then Madeline said not yet. Okay, cool. Claudia is a vampire and you know, the bitch is old, okay? If she was working, she'd be retired by now, okay? So she's somebody, all right? But she presents as a child. And so that is just weird and weird and wrong and just off. I just, eh, get a good. It's just gross to me. Why is she not freaked out, you know, a little bit? Like, why is she just like, oh, okay. Like, why was that not even a thing? Like, first of all, you didn't know that vampires existed for real until like, 45 minutes ago. And now you just like, yeah, girl, you want a little drink? What you got going on? Let me lay in the coffin. Something, something is awful, Madeline, child. I don't, Claudia wants somebody to turn Madeline. She doesn't want Louis to turn her because she don't want Lestat's blood to be, she don't want no blood relations because it's all too, just too much. So we goes to Armand and it's like, like, babe, I need a favor. I need you to make this girl for Claudia. Imagine me without the burden of her. <laughs> what? Imagine me without the burden of her. And our mind is like, so you mean to tell me you want me to make the abomination a prize? Is what you're saying? Claudia tried to do a little glad hand and then she's like, Matra, you know, Paris is yours. Like, I'm just asking respectfully for you to make her for me. And and so our mind gets mad and is like, you're a manipulator. Claudia de Leon Core. And I was like, he ate with that one. He did. He did. So now Armand puts Madeline on a damn vampire job interview, baby. He's like, well, what you gonna, how you gonna eat? And are you, how you gonna feel eating people? You gonna kill people and you gonna eat the people like you eating your apple? Wait a minute. So Madeline was eating the apple with a spoon. And I swear for Lord, I have never seen anybody eat an apple with a spoon before. I don't know if that's a French thing. 
I don't know, but it was very strange. So I was like, this bitch is weird. And then first of all, she wasn't scared of Armand. She told Armand go fuck himself several times. And I was like, okay, I like that. I like that energy. He did all of that for nothing because eventually he was like, nope, I don't want to do it. And Louis, of course, was like, well, what the fuck you did all that for? That was a waste of my damn time. So over there at the Theatre de Vampire, they still rehearsing this fucking play, okay? And so Santiago and Armand are starting to get into it because, of course, Santiago got his own stuff in the works, even though, you know, Armand is like, I'm going to just kill him again. And Santiago is like, I'm about to just... Like, he don't even know. He don't even know, okay? Fit, like, they're having, like, a philosophical disagreement about this plate. Santiago started yelling at Armand, and he calls Armand fangless. And then flies up over Armand's head and then comes back down in front of him. Baby, let me tell you something. Don't fly, don't put your feet in front of my face. It would have been dope if Armand would have been like, <laughs> and it like, got up and, like, flew to, and they was fighting in the air like the white vision and regular vision and Wanda vision. You know what I'm talking about? That would have been dope. But Armand stayed on the ground because, you know, he be getting on my nerves, child. Now, Armand and Louis are together and they're going on one of their little nighttime walks, child. And Louis is still on one. He's like, I'm going to just go ahead and do it. I'm going to just go ahead and make Madeline. And because you was out of pocket for that. Like, everybody in the coven got a little somebody. So the whole problem is that Armand has never made a vampire. So Louis was like, well, fuck it. I'm going to do it. Armand's supposed to run all the streets of, of Paris for the van on a vampire tip. You're not supposed to do that. How you going to hide? hide how, who going to check me? I lead this coven, not you. So because we fucking, you get to tell me what to do at my job? What kind of lack of boundaries do we have? He's supposed to give permission. He not supposed to just be like, oh, I guess you can. What kind of, listen, Armand got the chill because one the one episode I be wanting to get with Armand and then the next episode I be wanting to punch him in his face. And it's like, bro, make up your mind. Okay, I don't, I can't, I can't keep up. So Louis decides to make Madeline. When he's biting her and like making her, he sees like her memories of her life. Basically, old girl had a shitty life. I ain't gonna lie to you, her life wasn't no crystal still. But her parents did and then the war came and then they shaved the head and you know, she fucked the Nazi. It was just, she had some stuff going on, child. Louis also saw that she saw Claudia in a way that Claudia couldn't never be. Like she saw Claudia in the light and like, you know, holding flowers in the daytime and shit. Obviously that could never be because she's a man. She really saw, you know, the way that Madeline saw Claudia, right? Still didn't help me none because Claudia's a child. I just can't, I just can't, I can't get over it in my noggin. Louis back at the house just sulking, okay? First of all, Louis got a funky attitude this whole go around. I wish I could be a talk therapist. For that. No, I don't, because they will murder me, because I can't keep my mouth closed. I'd be like, shut your ass up. I would never do that. That's not a part of the therapeutic process, but still. Okay, so so our mind comes in, and he got a suitcase and a little flower on the top, and, and I'm looking like, bitch, where you going? He sees Louis, and Louis got his wrist popped, okay? And he just sitting there just dripping and dropping all on the floor. Like, he, you know, has a, a, a fledgling, and, you know, he feels some kind of way about it, but also don't feel no kind of way about it. Once again, our mind pops out another fantastical ability of being able to cure somebody's bust open wrist jugular vein. You don't have a jugular vein in your wrist. What's the name of it? A vein? I don't know, child. He didn't made Louis stop bleeding. And I'm like, what? You got super glue in your hands for like flesh? Like, damn. The coven gave me an ultimatum. They say, choose your yam, also known as Louis, or stay with us. And so our mind was like, I choose you, baby. I cc every girl that I cc around town. Okay, he chose Louis. Now they just gonna be together. All right, so some time passes and Claudia and Madeline come and say, hey, let's do dinner. All right, and they have dinner with our mind and Louis. Claudia and Madeline and Louis and our mind are at a cafe, right? And we in Paris in the 40s, okay? And if you have lungs, you smoke. That's just what happened. Okay, you could be pregnant, you could be dying, you could be dead, and you're gonna smoke. Our mind gets up to have a cigarette outside. That's when I knew that the piece of shit that is he was about to be on the scene. Because why are you getting up? Had Louis and Claudia and Madeline been paying attention to their surroundings and saw that, they wouldn't have got got the way that they got got. Okay? Our mind obviously in on the thing. 
see Santiago coming down the street looking real sketchy and just, you know, just kind of evil with burlap sacks over his shoulder. Baby, he wasn't about to do no no um, potato sack race, baby. It's not field day. Kidnapped. They beat shit out of him and brought him back to the, the, the theatrical day vampire. The theatrical day vampire said, baby, listen, this is a special occasion, all right? We coming outside in the daytime. Okay, put your shades on, all right? Preferably stunner shades. One night only. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You want my loving soul right on around. Come on now. <laughs> Okay, baby Santiago was like, "This my this my time to shine, baby." He put on some leather and and, and a cape. You know, if Santiago got on a cape, bitch, it's over for y'all. Okay, baby, we about to have us a vampire trial, baby. So if you got some shit to do, put that shit on the back burner. Okay, I don't know what day of the week it was, baby. Jam pack, okay, in the middle of the day. So none of these people was at work. It had better been a Saturday, baby, because y'all supposed to be rebuilding after the war. Y'all ain't got no time be getting a little messy vampire shit. All y'all could die in anyway. And so one of the little the little vampire people, he looked just like the white shrew from the office. Okay. The white shrew go downstairs and he say, hey, um five minutes, Mr. De Leon Cor. Is that my steady pooty? Hey steady pooty. What you doing? You didn't even tell me he was coming. I would have I would have got dressed if you'd have told me he was coming, steady poo. I want that booty. Baby, listen, looking himself dead in the, in the, in the, I was about to say the cuticles, in the corners. <laughs> really focused in, okay, on what he was getting ready to do because he was about to go in. And that's where the episode ends. So that's why I said this episode wasn't my favorite episode of the season. It's probably my least favorite episode of the season, but that's okay. Because they're getting ready to traumatize me in episode seven and eight. Next episode, my Staddy Pooty gonna be back and it's gonna be so good, y'all. I'm so excited about it. Listen, he did a fantastic job with all the people in the episode. Everybody was holding their own. Everybody was doing their thing. They make me wanna go to acting school because I'm so dramatic. I feel like I would be a great actor, but I don't think I could look at you in your eyes like that without I don't know, just feeling like it was real. I don't, comment down below and let me know what you thought of this episode. Let's talk about it, y'all. We got some mess coming. We got to prepare. I'm going to talk to y'all later. Bye.